So, uh, cringy moves and a white B girls do rag prompt questions about uh, Olympics break uh, the Olympic breakings authenticity. Yeah, all right. I don't understand what the fuck, but we're gonna find out. This was reported today. Uh, it was in Paris from the Australian B girl with the meme worthy kangaroo dance move to the silver medal winning Lithuanian in a do rag breaking Olympics debut. Had a few questions, a uh, few moments that raised questions from viewers about whether the essence of hip hop art form was captured at the Paris Games. I can't stand when y'all motherfuckers do this shit. I really and honestly hope wherever the fuck y'all are from. That's what you grew up to be doing. Like, you grew up to do that shit. Because otherwise, you you are uh, fucking appropriating. We've had areas where we've had black, uh, white dudes grow up with us and all that shit. And the motherfuckers lived in the same situations as us. So we accepted that shit. And they still had the same decency not to try and be something they weren't. How the fuck y'all end up with this shit? Is I, I don't get it. Anyways, Rachel Gunn, that's her name, or B-Girl Ray Gunn, I hope somebody stubs your toe. A 36-year-old professor from Sydney, Australia, you, you, you need your ass whooped, quickly achieved internet fame, but not necessarily for Olympic level skill. Competing against some B-girls half her age, she was swept out of the rob, uh, round robin stage without earning a single point, and her unconventional moves landed flat while failing to match the skill levels of her foes. Why the fuck was she entered in this shit then? Lord. At one point, Gunn raised one leg while standing and leaned back with her arms bent towards her ears. At another, while laying on her side, she reached her toes flipped over and did it again in a move dubbed the kangaroo. That's, I wouldn't, I wouldn't name that shit. That don't sound right. I'm gonna promise you right now. Gunn has a PhD in cultural studies. How? And her LinkedIn page knows she is interested in cultural politics of breaking. You need your ass booked. I was never going to beat these girls on uh, what they do best, their power moves, said Gunn. What I bring is creativity. That doesn't look creative at all. It looks stupid as hell. You look like an idiot. Oh, Lord, have mercy. Clips of her routine have gone viral on TikTok and elsewhere, and many cringed at her moves platformed on the Olympic stage as a representation of hip-hop and breaking culture. I come from fucking breaking culture. I wanted to break dance, but my mom wouldn't let me. But damn it, if I didn't stay close near to motherfuckers, how dare you? It's almost like they are mocking the genre, wrote one user on uh, Twitter. I refuse. Some of it was weird to see. Many black uh, viewers in particular called out Lithuanian silver medalist B-girl Nika, legally named Dominika Banovic, for donning a do-rag during, uh, during each of her battles. Do-rags once worn by enslaved Africans to tie up their hair for work are still worn by black people to protect style, uh, and style their hair. They became a fashionable symbol of black pride in the 1960s and 1970s. In the 1990s and nearly 2000s also became a popular element of hip hop style. But when worn by those who aren't black, do-rags can be seen as a cultural uh, appropriation. The jackass with the long name and the weird symbol is white, because I ain't saying that name again. An uh, actor, Kevin Fredericks, responded to in uh, on Instagram to the dumbass donning the headwear by saying it looked weird to see somebody who don't need it for protective styles or waves to be rocking the do-rag. That's all I knew a do-rag for was to get the waves. The 17-year-old breaker ultimately won the silver medal after losing to in the final to Japan's B-girl, Ami, Ami Yuasa. For her part, the dude, the person with the B name, has credited the breakers from 1970s in the Bronx, the OGs, or the original gangsters, gangsters with a hard ER. That's what this dumbass said. In hip hop, who created the dance for her own success and breaking style? Please don't do that. Please don't. You look like an idiot. Actually, you actually look like a cancer. Um, you really look like a cancer patient. That's what you look like. I'm not even gonna lie. That looks weird as fuck. It does look weird. You look like a cancer patient wearing that shit. Oh, no. 
It's a huge responsibility to represent and raise the bar every time for breaking because they did an amazing job. Big respect for the OGs and the pioneers that invented all those moves. Without them, it wouldn't be possible, she said. Without them, breaking wouldn't be where it is today. So I'm grateful for them. Just take that shit off your head. That's all I can say. Concerns over losing breaking roots. Uh, Friday night slips may have alienated two many new viewers to garner the anticipated response from our Olympic premiere, said Zach Slusser, uh, vice president of Breaking for Gold USA and USA Dance, in a text message to the Associated Press. We need to change the narrative from yesterday's first impression of breaking as Olympic sport. I did not know that was an Olympic sport. There were significant organizational and governance shortcomings that could have been easily reconciled, but unfortunately negatively impacted Breaking's first touching point to a new global audience because it never was meant for a global audience, Jackasses. The challenge for Olympic organizers was to bring breaking and hip hop culture to a mass audience, including, in other words, you want to commercialize a whole fucking culture. Great. Wonderful. Keep doing it. You're already gentrifying everything else. Why not our all our, our fucking souls and fucking and techniques and shit? Oh Lord. Others feared the subculture being co-opted by officials, commercialized, and put through a rigid judging structure when the spirit of breaking has been rooted in local communities centered around street battles, ciphers, and block parties. Hip-hop was born as a youth culture within black and brown communities in the Bronx as a way to escape strife and socioeconomic struggles and make a statement of empowerment at a time when they were labeled as lost lawless kids by New York politicians. Jackassy. A uh, refugee breaker, uh, Maniza Talash or B Girl Talash channeled that rebellious vibe by donning a pre Afghan women cape during her pre qualifier battle, a defiant and personal statement for a 21 year old who led her who fled her native Afghanistan to escape to Taliban rule. Talash was quickly dis, uh, disqualified for violating the Olympics ban on political statements on the field of play. Both American B Girls were eliminated in Friday's round robin phase. A blow to the country representing the birthplace. Uh, you know, that's a damn shame. Y'all need y'all asses whooped. God dang it. Where did they? Let me tell you the names. So uh, B-Girl Logistics, legal name Logan Edra, and B-Girl Sunny, Sunny Choi, both ranked in the top 12 internationally, but came up short of the quarterfinals. Y'all got to stop this shit. Breaking for Olympics has changed the way that some people are dancing, said Choi, referring to some of the flasher, flashier moves and uh, jam-packed routines. Breaking changes over time, and maybe I'm just old school and I don't want to change. I think a lot of people in our community were a little bit afraid of that happening. B-Boys take the stage on Saturday to give Olympic breaking another chance at representing the culture. So, oh, God, thank God I missed that one. See, this is why I don't watch the damn Olympics that much. What the fuck is that? Oh. Next thing you know, they're going to have crumping, and I swear to God, that's when I'm just going to stop. I'm done after that. That's all I got to say. I am fucking done after that. But we're going to continue with uh, the better news, at least. Uh, at least I got to change my response, my face. I got to fix my fucking computer now. Anyways, uh, let's look into what happened with uh, a basketball in the Olympics. Apparently, my mother was watching that earlier. So, you know, whatever. Aja Wilson, U.S. women hold off France to win eighth straight Olympic basketball gold medal. We're doing very good. Very, very good. In Paris, Aja, Aja Wilson scored 21 points, and the U.S. women's basketball team survived the biggest challenge of its unprecedented run to eight straight Olympic gold medals with 67-66 to 66 win over France at the Paris Games on Sunday. That had to hurt. No team had been able to push the Americans during this impressive streak of 61 consecutive wins. Only two of those victories had been by single digits before the game against France. Would you say divided snakes won bronze, I believe, in mint? Oh, okay, cool. I don't know who that is, but okay. Uh, let's see, where was I? Okay, yes. Um, 
Eight straight gold broke a tie with American men's program that won seven in a row from 1936 to 1968. The women's victory came less than 24 hours after the U.S. men's team also beat France in the title game. This was the first time in Olympic history that both gold medal games featured the same two teams. Damn, that's kind of fucked up. Unlike the men's game, this one came down to the final minute and one last shot by France that was just inside the three-point line. The Americans were up 67 to 64 with 3.9 seconds left after Kali, um, Kali Caper, uh, Copper hit two st- free throws. I can't read. Marine, uh, I, yeah, Johan, uh, oh God. This chick right here, Marine Johans, brought the game up the court to Gabby Williams, who caught the ball just inside the three-point line and banked in over the outstretched arms of Brianna Shrew. I ain't saying that name. I ain't never seen an SNR together that made a sound. Shri- like Sri Lanka, maybe? Oh. For the final margin. I hate you for your name, quite frankly. That's all I can say. There was a brief delay before the official signaled that it was a two-point shot, which led to the beginning of a celebration and a lot of happy hugs for the Americans and left the French uh, players standing in disbelief as they fell just uh, short. Good for you with that fucked up name. Williams, who finished with 19 points, had hit a deep three a few seconds earlier to get France within one before Copper's free throws. Whatever. I don't know who is who, but I just know that name pissed me off. But there you go. We won another gold medal. I, I just, I was desperate for good news. That's all I can tell you. I was god dang desperate for good news because all that other shit was just too dark. Now, last time I told y'all a, a list, a huge list of black owned companies that could probably help you with almost everything you needed. Well, I felt good about that. So here I'm going to show you uh, another successful business. So here we go, y'all. Emotional content. So how a black woman built $1 billion whiskey company inspired by a slave. Sometimes what makes a brand special is not just the product, but the story behind it. For example, when looking at Uncle Nearest, a whiskey brand, the company was created not only because CEO Fawn Weaver had a love for whiskey, but also because she was a she was curious about the story of a slave in Lynchburg, Tennessee. I fucking hate the name. I really hate the name of that place already. What the fuck is on that lady's neck head? Yeah, dang it. That looks weird as hell. Just last month, Weaver re, uh, released now. Why would you put her name in lowercase? That's just rude. Weaver released a book that goes deep into the story of how this enslaved black man influenced the creation of one of America's beloved whiskey brands, Jack Daniels, and in turn inspired her to create one of her own. While it was initially thought that Daniel learned distilling from a man by the name of Dan Call, it turned out that Nearest Green, one of the Call's slaves, in the ma- is the man who taught Daniel everything he knew. In 1967, in the 1967 book, Jack Daniel's Legacy by Ben A. Green, Call is quoted as stating, Uncle Nearest is the best whiskey maker that I know of. The story of Green reached national attention in 2016 after the New York Times published articles on how Jack Daniels had a mission of spreading the word about Green and his influence on their company during their brand's 150th anniversary. One of the people who read the article was Weaver, who has gone on to build up one of the most successful whiskey companies in recent history as the first black woman to be a CEO of a major spirit brand. Uncle Nearest is currently valued at one billion dollars. Go ahead, girl. Can you lend me some money? But Weaver isn't just doing it for the money. In her new book, Love and Whiskey, she not only delves even deeper into Green's story and family, she investigates the ways that Daniel ensured that Uncle Nearest's legacy will continue on even years after he's passed. This Nearest was a mentor, teacher, and friend to someone who would become a legend in the spirit industry. In an interview with Southern Living, Weaver said every generation has had a keeper of this story to make sure the legacy of Nearest Green never died, to make sure this relationship of love, honor, and respect between Jack Daniel and Nearest Green never went away. 
Well, that's damn good. For this generation, Weaver is the keeper of this story, and she's doing her part to ensure that it's never forgotten. Well, go on ahead, girl. 40 goals for divided snakes tied with China. What are you? Okay. You on another story. I'm sitting up here talking about a, a billionaire. Let me see here now. And that's the end of that story. So go on ahead, girl. I ain't mad at you. I get tired of uh, reporting these sad stories sometimes. So, you know, sometimes I'm just happy as hell to report something good. Now, let me see here now. All right. So next we got some celebrity news. And then we got a few. Yep. We got a few. Um, what you call this, too? Um, I'm going to move that one. Let's get on with this bull first because you know how I do. Oh, Lord. Here we go, y'all. What the hell is that? 